As I told us, he didn't just come in to the gathering alone. He came with another lover of your people. He is a professor of professors. And so I have the great honor to introduce our special guest speaker today in person of Professor Pat Utomi. <laughs> Professor Pat Utomi is a political economist and professor of entrepreneurship and is a founder and chief executive officer of the Center for Values in Leadership. He is a, a fellow of the Institute of Management Consultants of Nigeria and founding senior faculty of the Lagos Business School Pan-African Atlantic uh, University. He is the chairman and chief executive of the Integrated Produce City, IPC, as well as executive vice chairman of Smart City Lagos, a joint holding with Dubai Holdings by Smart City Dubai. He serves on the African Board of Leading Global Professional Service Firm, Deloitte, and was director of the Center for Applied Economics at the Lagos Business School. He has served in senior positions in government as an advisor to the President of Nigeria, the private sector, as Chief Operating Officer for Volkswagen of Nigeria. And many of you don't know about Volkswagen of Nigeria. And also in the academia. He is the author of several management and public policy books, including the award-winning Managing Uncertainty, Competition and Strategy in Emerging Economies, 1998, and in 2006, another book titled Why Nations Are Poor, as well as The Art of Leading in 2016. <laughs> Professor Pat Utomi has passionately pursued the building of a viable opposition political party in Nigeria and transparent, accountable government. He was a candidate, the candidate for presenter, president of Nigeria both in 2007 and 2011. He is a man of faith and family who is widely traveled all over the continents of the world. He has visited more than 80 countries worldwide. At this juncture, I want to specially request you be on your, seat, on, your, on your feet as we welcome our guest speaker to present a speech on the making of 21st century set, uh, young entrepreneur and leader. You yeah, are welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please let us be seated. I, I feel so blessed and so honored to be in the presence of the GS Pastor. I am truly honored to be in your presence. I feel excited that the future of our country is gathered here today. I want to assure you that he has raised you up to be what you want to be, what you can be, and you can be whatever you dream that you want to be. You know, I like to tell stories a lot. And one of the famous stories I like to share is the story of some young people who wanted to confound a sage. This sage, this wise man, was always right, it seemed. 
And so these young people wanted to prove that he was not as smart as he thought he was. And so they came to see this sage. And they had a bird. A small bird in their arms. And they had their arms behind their backs. And they said to the sage, Great sage, if you are so wise, tell us, this bird that we are holding behind us, is it alive or is it dead? And the sage looked at them, saw that they were very clever, but that their hearts were twisted and he smiled and he said to the young people you see that bird that you're holding its life is in your hands if i say that the bird is dead you will release it alive and fly and say sage you are wrong if i say the bird is alive you will squeeze it to death and bring out your hand and say, Sage, this is a dead bird. And so I want to say to all of you today that the future of Nigeria is in your hands. You can turn that future to a great one if you have one or two simple things if you believe if you have faith and you are willing to do the work that it takes our country can reap what is today referred to as a demographic dividend from its great youth population a country endowed with a youth bulge with a lot of young people can be anything that it wants to be if it invests appropriately in the education of those young people and the young people who have the appropriate values they can create a great society let me give as illustration of how the youth of any nation can turn its fortunes around I was a graduate student in the United States of America in the late 1970s and America's fortunes were dwindling. America was sliding backwards. American companies were falling behind Japanese companies. The Japanese had moved into leadership in many areas. In those days, on the U.S. campuses, when the month of May approached, and May is the month of graduation, you will see final year students, seniors, as they call them in American speak. Seniors will be working on their CVs, getting ready to go for interviews, and the jobs were not there. Inflation was at 29%, something unheard of unbelievable in American economic history. There was a nice, wonderful man as president. It was called Jimmy Carter. But everything was running the wrong way. And then, a man called Ronald Reagan got elected. And Ronald Reagan called out the American spirit and the youth of America began to respond to the challenge of a new America. Several years later, I went back to the United States on sabbatical leave. On campuses, as May approached, the youth were not working on their CVs. They were trying to finish their business plans. And they had created a brand new economy. It was called the dot-com revolution. And suddenly, 19 to 26-year-olds had completely turned around the fortunes of America. They had created the new industry with the conversion of 
convergence of streams of technology such as computing, telecommunications, and broadcasting. And suddenly, America was back again. The youth of this country can make Nigeria rise up again. The challenge is the challenge of how you prepare yourself to be 21st century young entrepreneurs and leaders. How do you become a young entrepreneur? How do you become a young leader? The first thing that I want to suggest to you is that entrepreneurship and leadership should come naturally to you because that is what you were purposed to be. That is what God created you to be. One of my favorite mantras is from Genesis 2.15. I tell people that if we realize that the purpose of our creation is to be like God, to be co-creators with God, helping to move creation towards his perfection. So when God created us, he purposed for us to be entrepreneurs. And when God created us, he purposed for us to be leaders. That's why he gave us dominion over the earth. Why are we failing to take this natural gift, this natural expectation of us to be entrepreneurs and to be leaders? All of society would not make progress unless it can manage to raise leaders, unless it can manage to raise entrepreneurs. But let me give you a small insight which came to me as the youth choir was performing so excellently this morning. It comes from a famous Canadian writer who I am told has some Nigerian blood actually. One of his grandparents by way of Jamaica has Nigerian blood. A writer known as Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell is one of the greatest writers of our times. He has written a number of interesting books such as David and Goliath. But in his book, Outliers, he talks about how people get to become so good at what they do, at proficiency. It is easy to watch Michael Jackson performing and his dancing style looks so natural. But Michael Jackson would never be able to perform at that level unless he put in remarkable numbers of hours of practice. And Malcolm, Pry Malcolm Gladwell estimates that it takes about 10,000 hours of practice to be able to be an outlier performing at extraordinary levels. The kind of performance that the Michael Jackson offers. And so, the big challenge is that in our culture today, we have lost an understanding of delayed gratification. Practice, 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 so that tomorrow you will be the champion. Instead, we have built a society of instant gratification of people who are looking like they are gambling. Black, you win, ready, you lose. I do this, I get Range Rover. People are not thinking delayed gratification and the kind of hours and hours of practice that leads to perfection in the things they do so that they can prosper from those things that they do. I think it's important for us to recognize that the possibilities that are available to us to become 21st century entrepreneurs and leaders have to come 
from commitment, a passionate sense of service that will lead to our personal growth, that leads to society's advance. Allow me to begin by speaking to leadership and what it means to be a leader and why leadership matters if the human race is to make progress. Leadership really is a process of achieving sustainable, superior performance. Leadership is about being able to move society, move your activity, whether it is a business, whether it is family, whether it is even church, from this level to another level by getting people to collaborate in a way that they achieve a high level of synergy. How do we get that liberation, that transformation that leaders offer? I like to tell a story about personal experience in illustrating this. And this story goes back to the year 2008. In January of 2008, a friend of mine, then managing director of Newswatch magazine, Ray Ekbu. Ray Ekbu's daughter was getting married. And Ray had invited my wife and I to be sponsors at the wedding. Cut a very long story short, I went straight from the wedding to the airport to catch a flight to Dubai. And from Dubai, I visited with a friend. Next day, I went to Singapore to attend a program at the Haggai Institute in Singapore. It was a 10-day program. In fact, one of those who attended that program with me was Mr. Eluem Emeka Izeze, who is a member of this church. Now, because this program was in Singapore, and as some of you who know of my academic work may know, Southeast Asia is a prime area of my research. So I travel very frequently to Southeast Asia. So I have friends all over that region of the world. When they heard that I was in Singapore, everybody wanted me to stop by. And so we had a free weekend. So I fly to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia on Friday for the evening. I come back, I fly from Kuala Lumpur on Saturday to Jakarta in Indonesia. And then on Sunday I fly back to Singapore. That period was the week during which the new airliner the Airbus A380 was introduced. And the Airbus A380, the first route it traveled on was Singapore, Sydney, on Singapore Airlines. And because I have friends in Australia who keep asking me to, that I'm next door and I'm not visiting them, and next door from Singapore to Australia is eight and a half hours fly. For them in that region of the world, eight and a half hours is next door. So I thought it would be a nice thing to enjoy one of the first people to fly the Airbus A380. So I accepted their invitation to come to Australia. And I went to Australia, cut a very long story short. On the 3rd of April, 2008, I was speaking at the Center for International and Strategic Studies in Washington. And I wanted to illustrate leadership. And I said to them, you know, a hundred years ago, if I wanted to go to every continent of the planet, I wonder, how long do you think it would take me? Some people say, ah, a lifetime. You wouldn't finish it in your lifetime. I said, you know what? The year is only three months old. And as we speak, I have been on every continent of the planet. I've been in Asia, I've been in Australia, I've been in Europe, I've been in two African countries, I've been in Latin America, and I'm speaking today in Washington. I said, but you know what? A hundred years ago, a professor of physics was speaking 
here in the United States. And he said, within 50 years, man will be able to fly. And the audience burst out laughing. He said, these professors, I wonder why they are allowed to drink so much brandy so early in the morning. Obviously, this man is hallucinating. He believes that a man can fly. And then, a bishop, one bishop Wright, who was in the audience, raised his hand and said, Professor, I want to assure you that only angels can fly. Unfortunately, Bishop Wright had two sons who were mechanics. Within 10 years, his sons became angels because Orville and Wilbur Wright became the first men to fly. Today, flying is so routine that this African boy had in three months living a routine normal life been on every continent of the planet. The reality of the human experience is that most of the things you and I take for granted today were once considered impossible until leaders, until entrepreneurs came along and yesterday's impossible became today's routine. The challenge that you have as 21st century leaders is to overcome all these impossibles around the human condition. We, as a people, have a particular challenge. We live Sadly enough, in the country with the most miserable index on the planet Earth, Nigeria is the biggest collection of the absolute poor. All the research is coming out to show. The Brookings Institution, only a few weeks ago, published a study that showed Nigeria overtaking India as the biggest collection of the poorest of the poor on the planet. Just last week, the Bill Gates Foundation released a study showing that by 2050, 40% of the poorest people in the world will live in Nigeria and Congo GDR. We must reject this, and the only way we can overcome this is by becoming 21st century leaders and 21st century entrepreneurs. That we can create wealth in this country that we can show leadership in this country that will lead to overcoming this human condition and provide to most Nigerians what the Princeton University Nobel Prize winner in economics calls the great escape. The great escape from misery, from poverty, from the challenge of health. Angus Deaton, in his book, the Great Escape, Wealth, Health, and the Origins of Inequality shows how leadership allowed the world to escape those levels of misery. I am persuaded, I am convinced that in this auditorium today are many who will lead our country in the great escape from such misery, from such. But you have to be prepared for the work that it takes to make that happen, for the discipline that it takes to be a leader, to be an entrepreneur, and to be a true change agent. So what does this leadership mean? Leadership is a cost-effective way of building synergy to achieve goals. Leadership is about inspiring collaboration around a vision and set goals which facilitates achievement of those goals amongst stakeholders. Leadership is about navigating through change and uncertainty towards a preferred state. One of the biggest problems we have in the world is that change is constant, but people are afraid of change. Because we are afraid of change, we often do not achieve what is possible. Indeed, 500 years ago, a man called Niccolo Machiavelli 
writing in the book titled The Prince makes a powerful statement and I will quote that statement it says nothing is more difficult to bring about than a new order of things because those who profit from the old order will do everything to prevent a new order from coming about and those who could profit from the new order do not do enough to make it happen because man is incredulous in his nature not wanting to try new things until he has witnessed experience of it all through history what has enabled people to finally overcome uncertainty and change its leadership my prayer is that today many of us here will be able to stand on his shoulders so that we can see tomorrow more clearly and we can make that change happen for our people and we can provide true leadership leadership that will lead our country leadership that will lead our businesses leadership that will lead our families leadership that can lead the church through overcoming problems and challenges and bringing about a quality of life for people that we deserve and that we should have but how does leadership happen leadership is not magic leadership is a process there is a process involved in leading people and years ago i wrote a book titled the art of leading and in that book i offered what i called the leadership process model this model essentially involves three sets of activities the first is preparation before you can lead you have to be prepared the second is visioning and the third is executing or execution with preparation and this is a very very important part for our young people you cannot lead unless you have been prepared properly and what are the things that are involved in preparing for leadership one thing that you have to learn to be able to lead is that you cannot lead unless you know people do not follow people who do not know so you have to know how do you know you learn how do you learn and by the way to learn is not to have certificates there are many people who have certificates but do not know i often talk about nigeria as a country of certificated illiterates to learn what is most important is that you develop a habit of learning as a British writer called Bob Garrett is the author of several books such as learning to lead the learning organization and the fish rots from the head Bob Garrett says that once a person learns to learn he learns effortlessly I will give you an example of my own experience in the back of my car at every point in time you will find several books because instinctively when I get in a car I do two things I pull my seat belt and click and the next thing is I pick up a book typically amongst the books you will find in the back of my car at any point in time will be a biography of somebody because you learn a lot from the lives of others typically you will find a book on a specific subject in political economy or management that I'm reading at that time typically you will find the Bible and typically you will find a book on the faith spiritual reading those are usually in the back seat of my car and when I get into the car depending on my mood I just take one of those and begin to read the biggest tragedy that can happen to anybody who wants to lead is not to know and where you find things is the written word significantly so knowledge preparation for knowledge a habit of service sacrificial giving of yourself for the good of others i remind people all the time that leadership 
is other centered behavior if you are in front of a mirror and all you see is the most handsome fellow in the world the most beautiful person in the world well maybe you are not a leader because leaders are more focused on others than on themselves it does not mean that they are masochists they are delaying gratification if you are a good leader today your promise you will claim one of the promises of effective leadership for me is immortality your name will be in the hearts of men for a very very long time after your body has gone and if you lead well because leadership is love you love others well I am almost certain that you will receive that welcome after this life welcome good and faithful servant so an effective leader achieves what I like to refer to as the two immortalities the immortality of being remembered on earth and the immortality of seeing God face to face so how do we develop ourselves to have a sense of service so sacrificially give up ourselves always when I founded the Center for Values in Leadership, one of the things that we used to do with young professionals is every third Saturday of the month, we went into a poor neighborhood. We started from Ije, near Obalene, when we used to have mountains of garbage around that place, flowing onto the third mainland Axia. And young professionals working for MTN, working for banks, we'll get them to be collecting garbage what was that about? Yes, it was a nice service to the communities around those places. But more importantly, getting them to get used to giving of themselves to people who will never pay them back. When you develop that habit, that habit of service is easier for you in a later situation with major leadership responsibility to be sacrificial in your way. So developing a habit of service is a, an important part of the preparation. For leadership energy a leader has a lot of demand made of their time so the leader has to have energy and to have energy it means you have to do things well in terms of your health you have to exercise properly you have to eat well and all those kinds of things that is part of the preparation for leadership passion you do not go very far unless you are passionate about some things I tell you, a number of things are defining of my own experience. Part of the reason I always feel fulfilled as a person and not driven by titles is the opportunity I had growing up for a few things to happen to me. As a seven-year-old, I was an altar boy getting up at 5 a.m., riding the bicycle, to go and provide service every morning. And that period, John F. Kennedy was president of the United States. And I used to win all kinds of prizes because the missionaries there were Americans, American priests of the Dominican order in a faraway remote place called Guzo in northern Nigeria. And that was the trigger of a life of sacrificial giving of myself and if there's anything I can say about that life is that every day I see the benefits of giving of myself sacrificially and so I want to urge that we begin to prepare ourselves for leadership by these kinds of efforts that leads us ultimately to become passionate about some things you become passionate about the living condition of Nigerians. You become passionate about death in your environment. You become passionate about reining in undisciplined young people. You become passionate. Whatever it is, is your passion. Ultimately, that passion leads you to having a burden. A burden for something to be different in the world. That burden invariably translates into a vision of the world in which that problem is resolved. That vision is an essential driver of leadership behavior. The vision ultimately then leads you 
to a plan of execution to bring about that new order. This is the leadership process. Of course, execution involves articulation, clarity of purpose, and communication. So what kinds of leaders do we have in this world? What kind of leader do you want to be? Well, a famous American political scientist called James McGregor Burns has written uh, volumes on the subject of leadership. When I was a young graduate student in America in the 1970s, James McGregor Burns was president of the American Political Science Association. And I just published this huge volume titled Leadership. And he offers a typology of leadership. But most profound amongst the work he has done is to break leadership down to two major kinds. One he describes as transactional. The other he describes as transforming, or someone would say transformational leadership. Transactions involve, you, did, you do this for me, I do that for you. Typical leadership mode we see in Nigeria is transactional. The leadership that endures is transforming leadership. It's the leadership that changes society remarkably for good. Now what is it that brings forth transforming possibilities? Well, when you are a visionary and you see tomorrow clearly, that tomorrow which you see clearly may not be seen by the majority of the people. And so typically, they will be reluctant to travel with you towards that destination because they do not see that destination that you have seen. But if you are somebody who has consistently, sincerely given yourself for the good of others, people might begin to suspend their fear, their doubt about this thing that they don't see, which you see. And may follow you because of who you are because of the sense of service you have towards others towards this uncharted territory towards this destination that they cannot see when they then arrive there everybody says my goodness hooray thank god we followed this man here because when he was saying let's go there they did not see there one man that has gotten a lot of credit as one of the greatest transforming leaders in human political history is a man called Abraham Lincoln. Indeed, um, McGregor Bond's book on transforming leadership focuses significantly on Abraham Lincoln. And today, many new books are getting written about Lincoln's leadership more than 160 years after his death. What do we do to become transforming leaders? Critical is trust building with people through sacrificial giving of ourselves but very importantly is to have powerful capacity to see tomorrow abraham lincoln saw an america beyond slavery at the time most people did not understand why he would have a problem with slavery i mean what are you talking about cheap labor we have bought the man the man i own the man I let the man work for me it's my chattel it's my object but Lincoln saw a better tomorrow, a greater tomorrow, and struggled, eventually even gave his life for that struggle. Now today, people recognize that his transforming leadership has brought America to where it is today. So how do we build transforming leaders in our society? This is the great need we have of leaders of commitment. And I tell you an example. It takes character, character building to become a leader that is transforming. You have to have character. I am very privileged to be friendly with an elder called Felix Ohiwere. Now, Felix Ohiwere had a biography of his written a few years ago by a friend of mine who's a professor in America. And so, I was sent a copy of the book in advance or the draft to read and I 
discovered in reading that uh, manuscript that Felix Ohiwere attended a secondary school in Oweri called Government Secondary School Oweri and I was impacted heavily by the motto of that school which was in the opening chapter of that book Government Secondary School Oweri has a motto that runs like this work hard, play hard when wealth is lost nothing is lost when health is lost something is lost when character is lost all is lost it, it was enormously impactful for me and Abraham Lincoln was a classic man of character let me give you a simple example I don't know how many of you watched the film Lincoln but that was a very powerful movie now in the film Lincoln Lincoln of course as we all know came from a poor background in the age of aristocracy and all that even in America but he managed to garner the popular will and became president of the United States of America so he was coming to address the US Congress and all these noble men all these rich people now those of you who know anything about constitution making in the United States will know that in the early days of America you couldn't even vote unless you were a propertied man that was a measure of your ability to vote and so as Lincoln walked into Congress to give the state of the nation address some people were just son of a carpenter they were booing him and Lincoln stopped and said yes sorry shoemaker son of a shoemaker Lincoln stopped in Nigeria what do you think he would have done he would have ordered SSS to go and arrest those National Assembly members but Lincoln looked at and said indeed I am the son of a shoemaker but my father was so good at his art that nobody ever brought back a shoe he fixed and said it was less than the best work that could have been done now this is a powerful statement of character this was the kind of character that enabled Abraham Lincoln to offer America transforming leadership so leadership matters we need leadership to bring about our progress but essentially a good part of the progress that can happen will come through entrepreneurial initiative who are entrepreneurs entrepreneurs are people who create value where none existed previously who make something literally out of nothing too often many people are trying to extract rent where they could actually create enormous value Nigeria is a critical example of a country where we have become so focused on extracting rent we have oil a few foreigners extract a lot of money from oil put in the ground by God and we are all struggling on how to share it we are fighting in government civil wars are starting all over Africa to get a share of mineral exports and then a couple of young Americans sit together in a room and create a company that has more value than the entire Nigerian economy puts together Google is worth much more than Nigeria as a country with all the oil companies or every output so you see that the challenge of progress is not from what we can extract but what we can create out of our imagination in terms of value that advances the quality of life of others and so to navigate the entrepreneurial process we've got to deal with one opportunity identification how do we identify opportunity how do we move from opportunity to commercializing the venture and how do we go from commercializing the venture to 
essentially ensuring that we professionalize the venture so that whether we are there or not, that business will continue to thrive. This has been the biggest failing in Nigeria. I can tell you a story. A story from this neighborhood. Now, I went to a high school in Ibadan called Loyola College. I went to Loyola College, Ibadan, back in the 60s. And I remember many years later, a couple of young fellows who graduated from Loyola went to university, lived in this neighborhood. In those days, Lagos was the biggest dustbin in the world. Nobody carried your garbage. Everywhere was overflowing with garbage. And these two young men used to go from one uncle to another with their application for work. And then one day, one said to the other, but you know, we can ask the people who live in this estate if we can pick up your garbage for a fee. And they didn't even have typewriter. They wrote in longhand letters to the neighbors about whether they could pick up their garbage for them. And everybody agreed. And they got a few, rounded up some boys, got some omola kids, and they be, began to pick up the garbage of these people at night. Before you knew it, those two young men had bought themselves a hillocks to carry the garbage. Before you knew it, they had the uh, big uh, truck that moved garbage. Before you knew it, they were driving Mercedes Benz and their classmates were still looking for work. This is entrepreneurship. Using your imagination to create value for others which people are ready and willing to pay for. So our challenge is to create leadership that spawns entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship which drives people who have knowledge and a sense of service to create a new world in which we all have a better stake. I'm going to move to a close in my remarks in a minute. But I want to challenge the young people of this country to say that the biggest asset we have today is a youth bulge. The biggest asset we have today are young people who are available. The question is, can we convert them from statistics into high value human capital. Our young people will need to develop the values that will make them true instruments that they can become the leaders, the outliers that Malcolm Gladwell has suggested that we can be. Do they have the discipline? Because no leadership takes place without discipline. Leadership, entrepreneurial or otherwise, begins with self-mastery. Man, know thyself. If people can develop self-mastery that enable them to, in a disciplined manner, try to solve problems, truly I want to assure you that if you can dream it, you can make it happen. The challenge of this generation is the challenge of a generation that says, we can dream it. We have the discipline and we have the desire. We can see the vision and we want to make it happen because Nigeria must rise up again. I thank you and God bless you. You can do better. You can do better. That is a classical delivery by one who is a leader himself.